I want to talk about uh, the epistemology of the Enlightenment in this video. Epistemology, as you probably know, is the question of how we know what we know. Uh, it's a study of that branch of philosophy that has to do with truth and knowledge. You know, how is it that we um, arrive at something as being truth? Well, the Enlightenment uh, refers to the period that began, you know, in the late 1500s and involved certain changes in the way that we uh, look at the question of how we know what we know. And probably the start of Enlightenment uh, epistemology is Descartes, René Descartes. He's the one we would start with. Um, born at the very tail end of the 1500s and of course living into the, the 1600s. Descartes created uh, what we sometimes think of as the uh, Copernican uh, revolution in epistemology by, uh, and, and we sometimes call him the father of modern philosophy because he turned the question from what is true out there um, and, and maybe not even intentionally changed the focus to who am I as I look out at the world. So you might say that pre-modern views of the world, and we're all pre-modern to some extent, but especially before Descartes, there was a general assumption of what you see is what you get. There was assumption that there is meaning in the world. When I look at a person, a person is a certain thing, or the world is a certain thing. But there wasn't really much, uh, even throughout all of history, there really wasn't much of a turn to think, well, how do, how do my assumptions and my presuppositions and my glasses play in what I see out there you know in the world when I when I say that somebody is something what am I really what am I really saying am I really just projecting uh, a category on them from my mind and so by asking the question uh, about how do I know what is true how can I be certain of what I know Descartes turned the focus of knowledge from seeing things out there to the question of of how do I see things in here. And for, for that reason, more or less, we call him the father of modern philosophy. How did it start? It started with this, this question of what can I be certain of? What is it that I can't doubt? The, the 1500s were a time of great uh, turmoil in, in, in the category of truth because it was the age of the Reformation. This was the age where, the, where Martin Luther and others were questioning the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. They were saying, let's get back to the Bible. But of course, whose interpretation of the Bible are you getting back to? Luther had his interpretation of the Bible. John Calvin had his interpretation of the Bible. The Anabaptists had their interpretation of the Bible. And so without realizing it, by throwing off the church as the authoritative interpreter of Christianity in the Bible, uh, Martin Luther opened up a free-for-all that has ended up in tens of thousands of different Christian groups who all think they're just following the Bible alone. Why did that happen? It happened because they, uh, Luther took away any, um, any fixed authority for uh, what was true about God. Now, he, he said that he was turning to the Bible as the fixed authority, but because the Bible is a text, all texts are susceptible to multiple possible interpretations. And so even though uh, the, the, the Protestants like John Calvin said that they were turning to the fixed point of the Bible, what they were doing, I mean, history proves this beyond any reasonable doubt, that any uh, approach that claims to be based on the Bible alone will splinter into tens of thousands of different interpretations because to each individual, you know, there is the susceptibility to a different interpretation. All of this was the environment of uncertainty in which Descartes says, well, what can I know for certain? What can I say? I can't doubt that. And what Descartes found is that he could doubt just about everything, but that there was one thing that he could not doubt, and that was the fact that he was doubting. I think, therefore, I am, cogito ergo sum. This is his famous statement that basically because I'm thinking I know I exist now that now that's probably even o an overstatement there he knows that because he's thinking thought exists in our age of of uh, science fiction movies like Matrix and iRobot and so forth um, we know that 
um, I, I could be a machine or I could be a computer program. I mean, I don't think we're there yet. I don't, I don't, uh, I think we can continue to assume that we're truly, you know, in the year, you know, 2014 or whatever. Um, but, um, so, but, but Descartes would have been more precise if he'd have said, I, I think, therefore, a thought exists, something exists, because I'm doubting. I'm doubting, therefore, a doubt exists. And he tried to reconstruct then um, a system of truth based upon that fundamental principle that I'm thinking, therefore, I am, I am. Of course, there, uh, there are some consequences to this. Uh, Descartes has a tendency to create a sense of human beings as thinking things. It uh, tends to turn the focus more toward uh, thought and belief. This happens in Christianity even, where you have some streams of Christianity after, you, you know, in the, after the Enlightenment that basically see faith as a matter of your head, whereas faith uh, prior you know, to the Reformation was about uh, a, a wholehearted engagement into Christ. And of course, uh, this is more biblical, I think, truly, than, than the idea of, of faith as simply a set of, of beliefs that you check off on. Uh, but so Descartes turned us uh, toward looking at ourselves as a knower, realizing how much of me is in anything that I think. Uh, without realizing what he'd done, uh, Descartes turns the focus of philosophy away from the world out there and toward me as a person uh, looking at the world. Uh, Descartes also um, did, a, Descartes had an immense input. Impact, I think on the Western world uh, in a way that you, know, you, you may have never heard of him and yet there's a good chance that a lot of what you a lot of your assumptions may have been formed by him so Descartes is the is the one that really suggests that we have a non-material soul prior to Descartes the spirit or the soul was probably just a thinner kind of ethereal material as it were but Descartes drives a sharp wedge between our material self and our soul, uh, which is part of a different different kind of reality. And so he, he creates a kind of, of stark dualism between our bodies and our, our, our souls as two completely different kinds of substances, as it were. Of course, he's saying the sub soul is not a substance, really. Um, and so uh, this this. Uh, corresponds to the shift at this point between natural and supernatural where we have the natural realm that runs by one set of rules and the supernatural world that is above nature it's something different again this is a change in worldview because prior to Descartes it was more of a continuum uh, of, of, uh, of a chain of being uh, going from down here you know to up there where where God is and so uh, the idea of the soul as we now think of it has probably been uh, we think we see it in the Bible but what we're really doing is we're bringing these Cartesian assumptions about what the soul is uh, to our reading of the Bible we don't even realize because what the meaning you find in a text depends entirely on the definitions you bring to the text on the assumptions you bring to the text and so Descartes changed our assumptions about what the soul is and so now when we see the word soul in the Bible, we assume it's talking about what Descartes is talking about, more or less, and not even realize that the meaning of the word soul in the Bible would have been a function of what the word meant you know, 2,000 years ago um, when the New Testament was written. So Descartes uh, is, is the father of modern philosophy. He completely changes, um, uh, one way or another, uh, the way that we look at the world. And, and the Enlightenment, we've, we've uh, inherited that way of looking at the world ever since. Well, there were other uh, continental rationalists. Again, continental here, I mean on the continent of Europe as opposed to on the island of England uh, and you know, Britain, you know, Scotland, Wales, uh, Ireland. Um, continental philosophers were on the continent of Europe. Rationalists uh, are people who believe that truth is primarily arrived at with our reason uh, as opposed to uh, uh, our senses. Empiricists believe you arrive at truth your, through your senses. Uh, and so there's cultural elements here. Is it, is it a coincidence that most of the philosophers we think of from this period were rationalists on the continent? 
while most of the people we think of as empiricists were on the island of Britain in some way. Um, so again, culture affects what we think is true, whether we realize it or not. Ian and philosophers are not immune uh, at all to the influence of culture, just as I'm not immune to the influence of culture. Well, just a few notes on Spinoza here before we go on. He, he lived in Amsterdam uh, in Holland. He, is, uh, a, he was a Jew. He was uh, ostracized from the Jewish community because, for example, he was a pantheist. Pantheists believe that everything is God, that the world is God, that nature is God. That wasn't orthodox belief for a Jew. Um, Spinoza believed that we should read the, 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 the words of the Bible like we read other words. And to some extent, that's true, isn't it? Because when Paul uses the word tree, um, he wants us to think of a tree. And so uh, Spinoza, now the Bible may mean more, the Bible may mean more than what it meant, uh, but the first meaning of Scripture, surely, was a meaning that they understood. Um, if Paul wrote the Thessalonians, uh, what? how are the Thessalonians going to understand what Paul was writing them? If they don't take the words the way people use words. I mean, you, you pick up their, what, they didn't have dictionaries back then, but you would assume that to, um, to read Paul's letter to the Romans, you need to know what Greek words mean in the year that Paul writes Romans. Uh, you need to know Paul's background. You know, what, how does he use words? Uh, how did he grow up using certain Greek words? What are his idioms? What, how does his family talk about the vacuum cleaner? That sort of thing. Do they say sweeper like in Indiana? Do they say Hoover? You know, like in England, how did how, how does Paul how did Paul grow up using words? Where where has he picked up other words? And so, um, basically, what Spinoza is saying is, if you want to understand uh, what um, Isaiah meant uh, when Isaiah spoke to King Ahaz, then you need to know what Hebrew words meant at the time of King Ahaz in the eighth century B.C. This is not really that controversial. It seems pretty obvious. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of us who read the Bible as if all the words have these magical meanings or or you couldn't possibly have understood what the book of Revelation meant until today when finally we have, you know, uh, certain helicopters and, and so forth. But, but by and large, if the Bible uh, meant anything to anyone, it had to have used words in the way that people used words at the time it was written. And that's basically what Spinoza is saying here. The Bible may mean more than that. Uh, there may be spiritual meanings that the Holy Spirit can give it. I'm not denying any of that. But surely, if you want to know what Matthew meant when Matthew wrote for his audience, you need to know what words meant at the time of Matthew, not what the Holy Spirit is telling me today. The Holy Spirit can tell me something through the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, the Holy Spirit can tell me anything the Holy Spirit wants uh, through the Gospel of Matthew. But if you want to know what Matthew meant when Matthew wrote in the first century, then surely you need to know what words meant in their historical context. Um, so I, I like to think of there being uh, more than one possible inspired meaning of the Bible. There's the first meaning that was inspired for its first audience. And if you want to know what that first meaning was, you're going to have to know what Greek and Hebrew words meant. 2,000 years ago. You're going to have to know the historical context. You're going to have to follow the literary context. There's a science to understanding what it meant. Uh, an atheist could understand what it meant, assuming that the atheist was open to all the possible uh, meanings. Um, so there's no, there's not, there's, it's not a spiritual task necessarily uh, to understand what the Bible first meant. And now if you want to know how to apply it, uh, if you want to have the discernment of knowing what was that time, what was all time, if you want to know what the Holy Spirit is saying to you today on the basis of those words, then you're going to need uh, to be a Christian and to have the Holy Spirit. But um, I think basically Spinoza is, is correct in saying that the original meaning of the Bible was a function of what words meant when those words were first written. Uh, Spinoza was a monist. That means that he believed everything was basically made of one substance. I'm not quite sure what that means. I think probably it's crazy. Um, there are some things I've decided that it's not that I'm stupid, it's that they were. Um, he was also a determinist, as many were at that point in the 1600s, where you basically view the world as a machine, uh, and therefore 
Um, if the world is a machine, it has certain rules. And if you know the science, if you know the math, then you can predict everything that's going to happen you know, for the rest of the world. Again, this is the age of, of, of Thomas Hobbes. This is the world of uh, John Calvin. Well, it's a little later than Calvin, but that, that whole period was generally determinist in, in its zeitgeist or its flavor. The spirit of the age was determinist. Okay, one more honorable mention. Uh, God, uh, Gottfried Leibniz uh, was also a rationalist from the continent. Uh, this, uh, If Descartes was uh, Swiss, French, spoke French, and um, Spinoza was Dutch, Leibniz was a good old German. Uh, Leibniz believed that this was the best of all possible worlds. Uh, he didn't believe that God could have created anything less uh, than the best of all possible worlds. That's about all I have on Leibniz. Uh, Leibniz was a mathematician, um, but uh, we don't need to know much about him. Um, he was one of the one of the three great rationalists of this period uh, in the continent. Well, let's move on to the British empiricists. Uh, these were people from either England, Scotland, or Ireland um, who, um, I don't know of any Welsh uh, uh, empiricists from this time. An empiricist is somebody who believes that truth comes primarily through our senses, not through our reason, but through our senses. So John Locke is the father of modern empiricism. Um, we'll come across John Locke in social political philosophy. Locke's the one who said uh, we there are certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, for him, property. Um, Thomas Jefferson would draw on John Locke in uh, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, but basically, Locke believed that there was nothing in our heads that wasn't first in our senses. We started with a blank slate, a tabula rasa, a blank whiteboard, as it were. And that blank slate uh, is what we start off with as a child, and then our experiences begin to write truths. Again, um, uh, uh, John Locke doesn't, he doesn't really appreciate the fact that our brains or our minds organize the data of reality. That'll take Kant. Uh, for him, basically, uh, there's this direct correspondence between what we experience and what goes in our heads. This is an un untenable, this is an unsustainable point of view, um, but but it's, uh, it's getting us to where uh, we'll get on a future slide with Kant and what I think is a more balanced understanding. So for John Locke, we start off as a blank slate. We have simple impressions. Um, I don't know that, um, I think I miswrite wrote this. We have simple impressions uh, that come into our minds as simple ideas. And then our, our minds take those simple ideas and glue them together. Uh, so I might start off with a simple experience of a horn and a simple experience of a horse. And then my, br my mind glues the horn, the idea of a horn on the idea of a horse and I have a unicorn as a complex idea. Uh, so I think it's not, it's simple impressions that, that come into my, that I experience. They are written on, to, on my slate, on my brain, on my mind. They are written on my mind as simple ideas. And then my mind can combine uh, simple ideas into complex ideas like that of a unicorn. So John Locke gets us going in the late 1600s with uh, the rise of modern empiricism. George Barclay is Irish, and uh, he's a bit of an odd one uh, because he both is a empiricist and yet he is an idealist. An idealist is somebody who doesn't believe that matter exists. And so Barclay believed uh, that we are all ideas in the mind of God, uh, that there is no such thing as matter that is somehow separate uh, from from God, but we are ideas in God's mind. I'm not quite sure what that means. I'm not even sure how that would differ from um, from matter, uh, other than saying that it's because a thought is a I guess a thought is part of God, um, and so uh, I wonder if he blurs a little bit in toward panth pantheism here a little bit. But for him, to exist is to be perceived, uh, or in God's case, to do the perceiving. So. Being is a matter of uh, ideas. Um, if God thinks about me, then I exist. If God doesn't think about me, then I don't exist. Of course, if you've read the um, the novel Sophie's World, uh, this is a, a disclaimer alert, spoiler alert. 
um, don't you know turn the volume down for a minute uh, but in Sophie's world it as it turns out so you start off with the first half of the novel thinking that Sophie um, is the real person but as it turns out Sophie is actually a character in a novel and that there's a another girl named Hildy who's in the real world and Hildy's father is writing a novel to Hildy about Sophie and Sophie you can imagine the character in the novel within the novel Sophie is is very depressed to find out that she's just a character in a novel um, and but it illustrates Barclay's philosophy in the sense that <coughs> we turn out to be characters in a novel that God is playing out in his own mind uh, so there's Barclay who is the the rare uh, combination of somebody who is both an empiricist who believes that truth comes through your senses and yet is an idealist and that he doesn't believe that matter is something that exists separately uh, from God's thoughts. Well, our final empiricist of the day is David Hume, our friendly neighborhood empiricist of the 1700s. He's Scottish and you can go see a statue of him in Edinburgh uh, if you want to. He's a gentleman, he's a skeptic, um, he's a nice guy, he's a he's, uh, uh, good drinking buddy probably. Um, he took empiricism to its logical conclusion. You see Locke had made a lot of assumptions in the gluing of thing, things together. But uh, can I really experience the law of cause and effect? I can experience two things that happen, one right before the other. I can experience, uh, I can see a car and then I can see it hit a bike and I can see the bike go flying uh, but can I see the law that when cars hit bikes, bikes go flying? I cannot observe, strictly speaking, the law of cause and effect. I can only observe a series of events, one right after another. And so David Hume questioned all these things that we assumed glue together. Uh, but because, because Hume only would accept experience as the basis of truth, he basically had to say, well, we can't really speak of there being such a thing of cause and effect because we can only experience the cause and we can only experience the effect. We can't experience the law that causes cause effects. And since we can't experience, we can't say it's real. He questioned the relationship between facts and values. This is the, the thing that, that I, can, I can experience that when you stab me, it hurts and then when people stab people I can observe that it hurts but I can't observe the value that it's wrong uh, to stab people that there is a gulf for Hume between things that are true that I can experience and things that I say are right and wrong um, he, and of course this is a problem uh, even today where we ask you know is right and wrong well we don't ask it probably if you're watching this video but uh, some would question whether or not right or wrong is simply a question of subjective wish um, that uh, I don't want you to kill me and therefore I say it's wrong uh, for you to kill me. Well David Hume again says you can't glue facts and values together with experience and therefore we can't say that there is a relationship between things we say are shoulds right and wrong and things that we say you know that happen. Well um, Immanuel Kant uh, is the one who, um, and it may seem obvious, I think to me once you hear Kant's solution of rationalism versus empiricism it seems pretty simple you know and you wonder really it took them you know till the 1700s for them to figure out this thing it just seems so obvious to me uh, but the rationalists basically said that the way to truth is through your mind so you know Descartes basically says uh, I'm gonna lock myself up in a room I don't know that he actually did this I don't think he did I'm going to lock myself up in a room and think really hard until I finally come up with reality. That's the rationalist approach. Empiricists say, no, no, if you want to know what truth is, you need to get out of the house and you need to go and gather some evidence. And, and so the rationalists um, didn't seem to have a real good accounting for the fact that truth does come from our observations of the world. I mean, science pretty well shows how much truth can come from getting out and seeing the world. And, and yet, um, the empiricists, like Hume, can't seem to account for how you fit uh, those experiences together entirely. Um, Kant would say of David Hume that he 
woke him from his dogmatic slumber. I think Kant, by nature, leaned a little bit toward the rationalist, uh, but he could see from uh, from David Hume that there needed to be uh, some other pieces to the equation. And Kant's solution was basically to say that the content of my knowledge comes from my senses, but that the organization of my thoughts comes through my mind. Um, now, of course, they didn't have software uh, back in uh, Kant's day, uh, but I think this is a useful way of thinking about it. That if, uh, you know, because you have these programs that come on any, you know, if you get a, if you get a computer, there's probably going to be Microsoft Word on it or some sort of word processing software. You input, you know, the, the software is not going to write your paper for you. So if you have to write a philosophy paper, um, the software is not going to write it. But the software on your computer allows you to input the stuff for the paper, and it'll help format it. It'll put it in a, you know, in a format that you can then email someone or print off. And so, um, although software obviously didn't exist in the late 1700s, Kant basically, this is a good analogy of what Kant was saying, that our minds come equipped with certain software to process the input of our experiences. So time and space software, Kant, Kant believed that the, the putting of experience into a succession of a framework we call time, or putting objects into a framework we call space. Kant said, you know, our minds come with time and space categories that help us organize the series of events of time and the series of objects in space. I can't experience time. I can only experience this moment and this moment and this moment, and I can only experience this space and that space. So how is it that I have a concept of time? How is it that I have a concept of space? How do I glue those individual experiences together? Well, Kant said, my mind comes equipped with that software, with time and space categories. Cause and effect. So Hume says, I can only experience this event and this event and this event and this event, and that I can't experience the glue that glues those events together. Well, Kant says, no problem. My mind comes, as it were, with the categories of cause and effect, with cause-effect software that helps me to plug in my experiences into uh, the law of, of cause and effect. And, of course, Kant believed that everybody comes with equipped with a certain kind of moral glue as well, a moral glue that says that not only can I experience uh, s someone killing another person as an event, but I can experience an, experience that as a bad event. I can glue the fact of somebody stabbing someone to the value that it's wrong uh, to stab somebody. And so Kant seems to have um, uh, Kant's categorical imperative. I, I've said elsewhere I don't think it works at all. Um, in fact, I, I consider Kant's categorical imperative a grave embarrassment. Basically, he thought you know, if, if something's a command, if something's an imperative, then it's categorically a command, which creates this ridiculous situation where every ethical command has to be an absolute. Well, well, you know, what about putting the seat down on the toilet? Um, should you put the seat down on the toilet? Uh, if, you know, there, if, there's a, if you're a male and there's a woman in the house, uh, you should probably put the seat down after you've used it. And if you follow Kant's philosophy out, he would say that uh, if it's if it's right to, you know, it's an absolute, you must always put the seat down. I mean, it, it's just uh, insane and ridiculous, the idea, the idea that every imperative would be categorically imperative, that every right or wrong would always be an absolute right or wrong, defies any common sense whatsoever. There are almost, there are absolutes, uh, there are moral absolutes, but the overwhelming majority of shoulds uh, have exceptions. Should you do this? You know, in some cases, it's situational. In this situation, you should do this. Should you do this? And sometimes it's cultural. In this culture, you should do this. Sometimes it's universal, but with exception. Should you obey the authorities? Yes, you should in general obey those in authority over you. If the authorities tell you to kill your sister, no, you shouldn't. And so this idea that right and wrong is always absolute is, is just completely absurd if you follow it through uh, to its logical conclusion. Yes, there are absolutes. Love God, love your neighbor. No exceptions to those. Thou shalt not murder. No exceptions to that one. But you know, obey those in authority over you. That is not an exceptionless uh, absolute. And so I consider more, uh, Kant's 
categorical imperative be a complete and utter ridiculous absurdity. Um, but I do like uh, the idea that we come equipped uh, with a sense of a connection uh, between certain facts and certain values. And so I appreciate Kant for that. Um, Kant believed uh, that the idea of a soul um, is part of um, uh, the assumption of our minds. And he, of course, believed that the existence of God was something that all, you know, we, it comes as part of the software package uh, of our minds as well. Well, this has been a uh, uh, not too long video on uh, the Enlightenment epistemology, where the rationalists are on this side of the soccer field and the empiricists are on this side of the soccer, soccer field, and uh, they couldn't seem to. Um, to one of them couldn't seem to win against the other and so Kant basically said this game is over let me give you the solution to this game and the solution is is that the content of our thought comes from our senses but the the organization of that thought uh, comes from our minds and so there you have it enlightenment epistemology